welcome to Kabbalah Revealed. I'm Tony Koznak. I'm a student, one of the students, of Rav Michael Leitman, who is the direct disciple of Rav Baruch Shalom Halevi Ashlag, who is the son and direct disciple of Rav Yehuda Ashlag, Bala Salam, better known as the master of the latter, who was acknowledged as the preeminent Kabbalist of the 20th century. I give you those uh, credentials because there is such a thing as a teaching lineage within Kabbalah. And what we are going to speak about is authentic Kabbalah. And we're going to give you a perspective, uh, not of uh, scholars, uh, but of practitioners, people who are Kabbalists. And in this series, you'll get not only an overview of authentic Kabbalah, but also the keys, the basic concepts uh, the ways of approaching this wisdom so that it can open to you. Because it is a, a way of study, a way of thinking, and a way of feeling very different from our normal sense of things. And it requires, as any skill does, um, uh, a mastery of the, of the basics. And in our series of uh, 20 or so lessons, we will cover all of the ones that are important for you to know. But let's start with uh, an overview of Kabbalah, because there's a great deal of confusion about it. There's uh, a lot of information about Kabbalah out there. There are, I think, maybe a thousand books a year are published on the subject. And almost none of them have anything to do at all with Kabbalah. They're just some kind of a mishmash of people's imaginations of uh, what they think it could be, what it should be, their intuition, their imagination. And it's not their fault. There's a great longing to know what Kabbalah actually is because there is a sensation that it's important, that it's powerful, and that it has a grasp of something that uh, is hidden in this world. It's called a hidden science for three reasons. One, it has been purposely hidden by the practitioners of Kabbalah themselves, by the Kabbalists. Kabbalah started 4,000 years ago with Abraham, around the year 1947, 1948, before the Common Era. And for that period of time, 2,000 years until the beginning of the Common Era, the destruction of the, uh, of the Second Temple, uh, it was not hidden. It was, uh, it was widely taught. You know the stories of, uh, of Abraham sitting in the door of his tent and welcoming travelers to come and, uh, and, and he would show his hospitality. Well, what he was actually doing was he was feeding them and he was teaching them about the wisdom of Kabbalah. And the type of souls that lived at that time in this world uh, were a little bit more refined than, than the souls that live now and they understood it more naturally. But something occurred at the beginning of the Common Era, at the destruction of the Temple, that made it impossible for people of that generation and for the 2,000 years that followed to really understand anything in Kabbalah. That's the point at which religions appeared. That's the point at which speculation about how this world works, what the universe is, what the Creator is, and so on, grew up in the imaginations of people according to a particular principle that that leapt to the forefront within the human being in, in their development. And this quality within people prevented them from understanding. And so the Kabbalists hid it. So if you don't have access to something, you still have the books. The problem is that it's also called a hidden wisdom because the books themselves are written in a very special language, unbeknownst to the people who are reading them. All the books of Kabbalah are written uh, in a language called language of branches in which they use words from our um, world, objects, cup, book, table, uh, family, uh, travels, wars, all of these things that you see in the, in the five books of Moses and all the other Kabbalistic books, but they're not speaking of anything in this world. Not a single word of any Kabbalistic book is referring to anything in this world. It only refers to the forces above which create and sustain the things that appear in this world. And so the Kabbalists used a, a special language that would indicate that uh, 
what they were really speaking about. And only uh, a student who had attained a certain wisdom would be able to understand and hear it that way. Now, you have to understand that the world that we live in is not a world of causes. It's a world of outcomes. There is nothing that we do in this world that uh, has any effect whatsoever on the upper world where, uh, where our source comes from, where the things that we see in this world take their roots. No physical action has any effect on it. And that's why any of the things that we do in order to solve our problems here in this world uh, have any effect whatsoever on their outcome. Only a connection to the roots, to the causal level of things, can have any effect whatsoever. And this is what Kabbalah deals with. Our reality as a whole is structured in such a way that there is a world that exists above, so to speak, and a world that exists below. And the language of branches points to what exists in the world below. It speaks about this object, let's say, a family. You, you read about it in the Torah, and the Torah appears to be the story of the Jewish people. Well, a family will move to a location called a land. But the Kabbalists are not speaking about this at all. They're speaking about the abstract forces above that actually create these things and make them occur. And uh, only a wise student can understand what's really going on here. This is the branch level, and this is the root level.